Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech on a given Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is Talking Tax with Tom Yamashika. Um, Tom, uh, today we're going to talk about the DOE, don't you think? That would be a good topic. And this is the subject of your commentary this week, so let's make it the subject of our show. Great. Um, the, the DOE is critically important to us and our economy. Um, it, uh, it spends like one out of every eight dollars that uh, is given to state government. So uh, it's got a, a you know, two billion dollar a year budget close to, like I said, close to an eighth of the entire state budget. So it's it's very, very important. Right now it has no leader, am I right? Well, it has an interim interim superintendent. So uh, with um, uh, uh, Christine Kishimoto, I, I think it is uh, her term expiring and they're, they're still looking for another a permanent superintendent. Um, they have a, They have an interim superintendent right now. I think they're looking on the mainland, you know, I always wonder about um, state organizations that feel obligated to, um, you know, do the recruiting on the mainland for senior jobs, when the job obviously is, um, you know, uh, defined by local considerations. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, it'd be, I think, much better if we had somebody local, but that's not always possible. I mean, the last superintendent came from uh, the mainland. Uh, and I think uh, that's a trend that's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, what What is happening there? And uh, how is the DOE flexing its $2 billion muscle? Well, in, in, in recent weeks, it's been no secret that the HSTA has had some concerns about uh, the teachers' working conditions. Um, schools are about to start up again with in-person instruction. Uh, and so that means teachers are going to be teaching a bunch of random kids. Uh, some of some are uh, some of whom may be unvaccinated. We we don't know, uh, especially on the elementary levels. Um, vaccines only recently have been approved for early teens and still are, are not approved for kids under twelve. So, so nobody's vaccinated in elementary school, and you know it gets uh, you know spotty, but but higher uh, when it, as you go to intermediate and high schools. And then, what, of course, what do you mean by random kids, Tom? Well, when when you're when you're a teacher, you don't get to uh, choose which kids you teach, and you don't get to choose which kids might be a greater risk for you. Eh? That's right. I mean, you 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 basically take what you're assigned. Right, and these days with Delta, um, you may be assigned a, a Delta case right there, even if you're vaccinated, and uh, then you know your risk is pretty good for a breakthrough. Right. So because of that, uh, HSTA, which is the Teachers Association, filed a class grievance, uh, which is basically a labor complaint, and asked for some dialogue with the DOE uh, about this. And here's what the DOE said. Um, it said they said, the governor's emergency proclamation dated August 5th, 2021, which, which has since been uh, updated, but says the same thing. It says the the, uh, the proclamation suspended the following provisions of law, uh, including parts of the collective bargaining law. Um, and it concluded with, um, as such, uh, we're taking no further action on the matter. So in other words, talk to the hand. Yeah, well, listen, you and I have discussed this a number of times in the past year or so about how these proclamations uh, have been over the top, but now people are interpreting them over the top, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, the proclamation itself um, uh, basically says, hey, you know, we are, uh, you know, suspending some laws to allow for the, um, you know, the flexibility for the agency to adapt to the COVID emergency. Um, and, and I suppose that's kind of where uh, DOE said, all right, so we can do what the hell we want. And, uh, and uh, you guys just sit back and watch because we're going to do it. What's the solution to the problem about the random kids and, you know, the, um, the, the, the kids who might infect a teacher? You know, that's, that's, it's a very good question. Um, there are 
uh, you know, protocols that the CDC has promulgated, um, like, uh, you know, lower class attendance or face shields or, or you know, whatever. Um, but, uh, but, the, but I think the issue is the, the attitude of the DOE administrators. It's just, it's just blatantly, you know, you have no say, go get the hell out of here. I mean, how, how the heck is that a good way uh, to foster labor relations? How, how can you have, you know, somebody working for you if you just tell them, you know, this is the, uh, this is the working condition. I don't care if you're concerned. I don't care about anything that you say, just get the heck out of my face and work. Yeah. I mean, what kind of yeah. <laughs> what kind of labor relations is that? It's not labor relations at all. No. It's just well, a dictatorship. I mentioned before the show began that uh, there was a time uh, when uh, Linda Lingle in running for office back in uh, what was it the year two thousand and two? I think that was the, the critical election for her. Um, her platform included a plank to divide up the DOE county by county. And in most places in the country, I mean, really a huge majority of places in the country, education is handled by county. The county raises uh, the money for education and aside from federal contributions, um, and the county runs education. That's what her platform was. Um, that, I mean, of course, there were transitional issues about that and practical problems and logistics about that, because DOE at, at the state level is so big. But what do you think about that as a, as a kind of solution to break DOE up into county organizations? Would it be redundant? Would it be effective? Well, um, th there are arguments on both sides. Uh, right now, there is really a, a, a very strong argument that, uh, you know, DOE has, is, is just too big. Uh, it has multiple layers of bureaucracy, uh, especially on the administration side. Uh, it has, you know, lots of different places uh, where you can hide money uh, and, and, and thereby escape scrutiny of, you know, fraud or waste or, or abuse. Um, it's, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just common sense, you know, when you have a very big organization, it's easier to hide stuff. And uh, the the other side of the story as well, um, we really don't want uh, a, 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 an education system centered around like one of the poorer counties because, you know, they may be, uh, you know, getting get, uh, pressured in one way, shape or form to uh, lower their standards and uh, and give people a uh, you know less for their less for their money uh, as when it came to education. So one uh, one thing that a a larger uh, organization is good for is uh, you know economies of scale, setting the statewide standards, uh, and you know, assuring uniform, uh, uniform education for, uh, you know, for, for everybody in the state. Uh, well, you know, that, that, that's that kind can, of worked, hasn't it? Yeah, I well, mean, with, with it, it cuts both DOE. ways. Yeah, go it ahead. Cut, it cuts both ways. Yeah, it, it's what I've, what, I've, what I've heard is, yeah, it's you know, uniform education, but uniformly mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> There you go. So we like uniform, but we we need it at a higher level. So yeah, and and you know we we uh, we have great success stories of uh, of, of of kids, uh, you know, throughout the school system. Uh, we we have like robotics, for example. We have the uh, the media center, uh, at I think Waipahu Robotics at McKinley. Um, there are several instances where our state education system has distinguished itself. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, uh, you know, the reason why the current uh, interim superintendent is in his current position is because he did amazing things as, 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 a, as a school principal. 
So, but you know, what's the management arrangement here? We have the DOE and we have like people on a board. Um, I, I think they are, uh, I don't remember, there was a contention a few years ago about whether they should be elected or appointed. I'm not sure how that works right now. Um, and then of course, there's, uh, uh, I guess when you say DOE, you are saying that that is the state apparatus for running education. I mean, uh, K-12 K education. That's um, right. And um, it, it, uh, then you have the committee chairs, Okay, but there's really nothing in between DOE and the governor. I mean, there's no director of education uh, in the state. The DOE is the next level. Below well, there's the, the school governor. board. There's, there's, the board of, there's the board Tell of education. The board of education. Yeah, the one that we just talked about, right? That's the board of education. Well, no, there's the agency and then there's the board. Talk about it. Okay, uh, DOE is is the state agency. Uh, it's headed by a superintendent. Uh, the Board of Education is, you know, a, a few uh, a few people uh, separate from DOE management, uh, and they help set policy and whatever for the school system. And then, of course, the the governor oversees the agency. But the agency is essentially independent. I mean, they do what they want to do, right? They're not really sitting at the at the cabinet level. Oh no, they they are. Um, I believe they are part board. of the cabinet. They're not an individual director of education, like you would have director of DLNR that sort of thing. One well, I think person. The superintendent. The, Wait, the superintendent and I'm getting is, lost now. You have the superintendent. Is the superintendent a cabinet position? I believe it is. Okay, and the superintendent deals with this um, this board, but but is the board above or below or uh, just advisory for the superintendent? I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah, that's 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 kind of more more in the weeds than I've gotten. Well, you know, the thing about it is that uh, we, we need supervision here, from what you say, um, and we probably need a, a, an audit too. You know, like a less condo audit. The state auditor, if there are problems about um, you know things that are happening and money that's um, being squandered potentially, uh, then we need somebody to look into it. Is there anybody who looked into it? Oh yes, the the state auditor does look into uh, DOE, but um, uh, with with anything else, uh, audits have what we call a materiality threshold. Uh, which means they don't look at stuff below a certain dollar amount. And with the $2 billion agency, uh, the materiality threshold is supposed to be pretty high. I mean, I, I, I don't know what it is, but we would imagine it's going to be pretty high. But what are the politics uh, that, you know, you have uh, HSTA is a very strong organization because there are so many teachers and you would expect that they would have huge influence in the legislature and with the governor. Is that true? Um, or are they contending with an organization that may have greater influence? Well, I think the uh, political dynamic is unstable right now because we do have an NREM superintendent um, and uh, and we have a new uh, head of the HSTA, Corey Rosenlee, as you know, um, termed out. He's running for, uh, I believe, state senate. And uh, another gentleman named Osa Tui uh, has taken the helm of HSTA. And this, this I believe, is is either first or second legislative session uh, in that position. Well, I mean, let me just wrap around all of that and edit. Is the existing management arrangement adequate to run an organization of this relative size and budget in the state of Hawaii? Well, I, I, I really don't know. Um, like I said. Uh, it's it's very easy to hide stuff because it's so big. Uh, going back to your original question, um, and, and I think part of the problem, uh, you know, may have been, and, and I've I've seen this in other uh, in other state agencies, uh, that the people at the top, okay, who are not civil service, don't really feel beholden. I, I'm sorry, the the uh, the the people under them, who are civil service, 
don't feel beholden to the people at the top uh, who are not because the people who are civil service are going to be there far far longer uh, than the people at the top are the people at the top change one once every four or eight years when it, when a new administration comes in but the but the civil servants are there and they last for a very long time so um well, i think this is a this is a problem that exists in many state agencies i can remember one in which i sat on a board where there was a um, um a professional employee call it of, of this particular organization and she um, didn't feel that her job covered certain things but the executive director felt they covered certain things and he, he asked her to do these things and she said i'm not going to do them so there was a um what do you call it a special committee um a, the kind of committee that's not subject to the sunshine law uh, to uh, investigative committee that was exact that was organized at this particular agency to look into it and when uh, this woman uh, came to us um, to explain her position she said i'm comfortable she kept saying i'm comfortable and the, the reason she was comfortable is that she was covered even though she was an exempt employee the union represented her i thought that was very interesting um and she said you know they can't touch me i've been here forever i'm going to be here forever I'm a long-term civil servant. Um, the executive directors come and go. Um, I have greater power than they do. And if I get into a disagreement, I'm, I'm comfortable. And indeed, when, uh, when this committee you know, came down on her and because of, she was ignoring her boss, um, presto, some legislators got involved and defended her. And then the union, even though she was, uh, what do you call it? Uh, exempt, employee. exempt employee the union came in and defended her as a matter of principle and before you know it she was vindicated and found right um even though she was obviously you know blowing off her boss so um, i feel this is not limited to the doe this is this happens when you have people in in long-term career positions that can't be touched certainly and um I don't know if the particular grievance that we're talking about today is is symptomatic of that, but um, it, it just shows a an attitude um, of of non cooperation, which I think is intolerable. Yeah. Okay. So let's take up on that strain. Why is it that we find ourselves in the land of aloha? Um, in a in a spirit of non cooperation, where people don't want to cooperate at all. Now, I, I'll take it from what you said at the uh, outset here um, that the union was perfectly willing to cooperate, wanted to have sit down and discussion, work it out as reasonable people. I'm, I'm assuming that, um, but the DOE, the state agency, was not willing, and they were not cooperative. Um, but it, of course, it takes two people to cooperate with each other. So what you're talking about is a culture point at, at the state departmental level, right? That's right. Uh, from the, you know, from the letter and the, and the tone of it, uh, it doesn't appear um, that, that HSTA was being unreasonable or, or anything. I mean, I think HSTA was saying, well, we have a class grievance, let's talk about it. And, uh, you know, DOE was just giving them the finger. No. Well, that it's, that I think is a problem. It's troubling because um, you know uh, I hate to make the reference to uh, Nero, and and uh, and the fiddle, um, you know, while Rome is burning, um, and uh, although as you said there are bright spots in in the uh, in the curriculum, uh, bright spots among the teachers, uh, bright spots among the principals. In general, we we could be offering a much higher level of education. And if we offer a higher level of education, our workforce will be better educated and more attractive to investment from outside, and thus more likely to stay here instead of leave. Um, and, and I wonder what we can yeah, do. Yeah, I, I think there, there's, yeah, there's, there's, I think, a lot of dysfunctionality um, that really ought to be um, investigated and dealt with. Uh, what, what can you do about? Um, 
uh, you know, underlings who, uh, you know, willfully disobey their 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 superiors. Uh, you know, something about that has to change too. Well, I'm afraid that's bits that's baked in into the Hawaii, you know, governmental arrangement. Uh, well, if it can be, if 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 it's baked in, it can be unbaked. I mean, that's how do you that's unbake it? You well, that's that's what legislators are there for. No, that's what the state could. The state auditor look into this, into the question of underlings not respecting their bosses and and thus undermining the whole organization. Well, the auditor could look into it, but uh, the auditor really has no power to do anything other than report. Okay. Yeah. It's well, so it's the it's the, the people that the auditor reports to, the legislature and the public, uh, who who are you know are reading the the auditor's reports, uh, that have to kind of clamor for action, and 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 uh, at the state at the state level at the legislature level get the action done. But the problem that you're talking about, you know, the problem which led to all of this is is COVID. So I, I point out two things to you. I and mean, one is, well, we live in special times and we're finding our way. And sometimes we're making mistakes as every other state and every other municipality um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, in a time of COVID, the governor de facto seems to have more power um, and the governor, you know, despite the, the fact that the legislature controls through its committees and, well, through its legislative powers, controls education, the governor could step in and do a little, uh, what do you want to call it, uh, elbow bending and fix this overnight, couldn't he? I don't know if it'd be overnight, but uh, he could certainly bend some, you know, bend some arms. Yeah. And hopefully that would, uh, you know, maybe uh, change some attitudes. We we, we would hope. Um, but then, well, what's know, interesting? If you're a longtime governor... civil servant, you don't have to listen right. to the governor either. And he has a, the governor has a special affinity for education. His wife was an educator, um, so he should be specially interested in making this work really swell. Um, but, but after uh, you know uh, proclaiming the. the those various proclamations over COVID and the suspension of laws, um, you know, he, he, that's all he's done. Suspended the laws that might help. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I think part of that is questionable too, because y yes, uh, there are, uh, there is legislatively given authority uh, to suspend laws in the case of an emergency, but uh, you, you kind of you, you got to really wonder if if this is the kind of thing that the legislature's that, that that the legislature was thinking of when it passed the law. Not only do we have uh, an you know, emergency that has kind of extended, you know, past the sixty days that it seems to be written for into basically a year and a half, uh, but but also uh, we have like entire chapters of the Hawaii revised statutes being ripped up um, it, because of because of this proclamation and uh, in at least at least in some instances the justification for ripping up those laws was questionable at best I mean how the heck uh, uh, is like distribution of TAT to the counties for example related to the COVID emergency there's a, there's a layering effect here Number one, you start out with uh, bad culture points around management and response um, in this huge organization, which which may need more supervision or maybe even uh, some, you know, breakup. Um, and then on top of that, you know, you get COVID, which creates all kinds of consternation and worry for people, parents, children, teachers alike. So it makes it more complicated. And then on top of that, <clears throat> you get to these proclamations that throw everything in kind of a state of confusion and they go on longer than they should. And on top of that, um, you know, you get, you, you get no action by the people who could take action and resolve this. 
And at the end of the day, you know, I'm afraid the, uh, the state suffers and the education of the children suffers. So that's why I want to make you a legislator. Uh, I want to make you a legislator in the Hawaii State Legislature. It will give you the, the power to fix this somehow. So my question is, what, what do those bills say that would correct these various things on a long-term basis? How do we restructure? Well, I think one of the things that we need to look at is, uh, you know, restricting or curbing uh, the governor's use of emergency powers. I mean, that's kind of uh, where we get away from democracy and get into demagoguery. Uh, so we have to have some checks and balances on that. Uh, if there were any, they haven't been working because they <clears throat> really haven't been tested in court. Um, as, as regards uh, the DOE itself, I mean, I think we have heard over several, several decades uh, the complaint that uh, it's just too big and and there are you know management levels upon management levels uh that that are just you know uh too huge they're so, comfortable <laughs> yeah so i mean maybe maybe you know breaking up the the beast uh but under the same board of education uh, might be a you know reasonable thing to do it sounds if, like if this have, is a a chore that's been kicked down the road. I mean, you say generations or decades rather, uh, and over time, and we, you know, I think we've all recognized there's a need to do something, but it's one of those things, sort of like infrastructure, where you know it's not high on the priority list. You let it go. You don't really reform it. You don't, you know, take some steps to examine, evaluate, and fix it. Yeah, and then and then it self destructs over time. Well, it's a structure into the, uh, into the education of our students um, and thus uh, our workforce. This is, this is a, you know, we have, to, we, have, we, we have to take every step possible to avoid being a backwater. And as we know, watching the mainland, for example, and the political crisis there, um, you know, education means a lot. And when you, you know, you talk about what's happening on the mainland politically, everybody says, no, we have to educate the kids better. Well. You know, so they understand there are three branches of government, for example, which they don't necessarily understand now. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it takes generations to educate a population of citizens. And it would take us generations, too, um, to make the schools better, to make the graduates better, to give them a better handle, you know, in, in life. Um, and I don't, how do you do that? You throw money at them? What do you do? That's that's a very very good question. I mean, I I don't pretend uh, that I know all the answers um, for a problem that's been bedeviling our state for you know many many decades. Well, here it pops its head out, and we see that the um, DOE is not even going to talk to the HSTA, which is too bad. Um, what what is aside from the fact that you're writing it up as a commentary, is there anybody you know talking about it? Is it is it reaching a level of uh, media concentration and awareness? Um, the the next logical step um, would be for the HS two HST to demand arbitration, which they did. Uh, what happens in arbitration is is not public, so the media can't really get to it. Uh, but that's where we're at. Well, what could happen? Uh, lots, lots of things could happen. In the arbitration, uh, in, the, in mediation, the arbitration, mediation, mediation, right. whatever. Arbitration. Yep. Arbitration. I mean, what, what are you going to say? Uh, all right, you you want to um, you want to uh, have have an examination of how this works with COVID and teachers and students and the like, and not have uh, random risks the way you described it. Um, so what, what's the mm, arbitrated answer? What could the arbitrators say to fix this? I don't know. I don't know what the arbitrator can do. All right, the arbitrator could, on the one hand, say, all right, all right, teachers, go away and get to work. Uh, on the other hand, you know, they, they could say, all right, do we, uh, you have to at least sit down with them, hear them out, and, and, uh, and respond meaningfully to, to their concerns. 
Mm. Okay, if, fair enough. And if and if they and if they you know respond by saying okay, we'll implement this protocol or that protocol, uh, the arbitrator can say okay, well that's that's fine, that's enough. Yeah, or the arbitrator can say I'm going to ride herd on this. You get back to me in you know a couple of weeks about how, how how it's going, and I want to hear I want to hear better and more. Yeah. Um, like but, anything you know, else, but 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 the thing is, they got to start talking, mm -hmm. and and, and uh, you know if they haven't already done so. And I I, I suggested that hey, you, we're in Hawaii. Let's use Ho'oponopono. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. That's that's for that's sure. uh, you know work for the ancient Hawaiians. Why can't it work for us? Yeah, always always uh, relevant. Always a a good choice to follow here. Yeah, People more listening, to it. less posturing. Yes. Well, I, you know, I think uh, my my reaction to you know your report on these things today uh, is that um, you know COVID has affected our our lives in a very profound way, every corner of our life. You know, I mean that's that's why I think Deck is so interested in in looking at these effects because we know that our society uh, has been is being threatened and remade. It's being reorganized for us, whether we like it or not. And that also means that we're, we're, we're finding out problems, we're finding things are being revealed to us um, because of COVID, problems that maybe that we weren't focused on before being revealed to us now. And uh, this is an opportunity, if you will, um, to recognize those problems and address those problems and find the, the tools, mechanisms, procedures to deal with those problems. So I think we have to look at it in a positive way and not let it get away from us and <clears throat> not let it just uh, you know sink back to the bottom of the priorities absolutely thank you tom tom yamachika uh, hawaii tax foundation and uh, we'll be back to you what two weeks with more uh, trying to find a better way here on talking tax with tom aloha tom <laughs>